So this goes beyond his economic ideas. He yes. had a certain uh, a moral standard which he held himself to. I guess that that made it so that he had to tell what he thought was the truth, and he had to uh, oppose oppose this regime. How do you think that his his kind of humanism, his background, his religion, all of the things that made up who he was. How do you think that this uh, gave him some some energy and some courage to do this kind of thing and to put everything on the line? Well, I think he saw himself as someone who was saying that all those background influences that you just mentioned, they constitute the essence of what's unfashionable today to call Western civilization. For him, this was something very real. And the rise of ideologies on the left and the right, he understood as threatening this very delicate civilization that he thought was, in a way, a type of epitome of the great achievements of the West. In fact, it's interesting, when he... He initially went to, the, to um, uh, the Netherlands after leaving Germany. He was there for about a couple of months, then went to England, where he met John Maynard Keynes for the first time. But in 1933, he ended up taking a position at the University of, uh, of Istanbul in Turkey. He was invited, like a lot of German exiles, by Kemal Atatürk to basically set up and modern, modernize the University of Istanbul. So he spent between 1933 and 1936 living in Turkey. And he says in several places in correspondence, but also in articles written later in life, that he realized at this point, because he was living in a society that was not Western, it was certainly modernizing, but it was not a Western society. And he started to look around and say, well, now I start to see really what makes the West the West as a consequence of living in a society that was that was not part of the West for obvious reasons. And so that very much clarified his thinking and got him thinking about what is it that makes the West the West. And if this is true, if this civilization is indeed a, a type of apotheosis of so many good things in history, and in the world of ideas, then those of us who have benefited from that have an obligation to defend it from all comers, whether it's from the left or from uh, the right. And again, as I, I think that's particularly apropos for our own time, because I think it's very difficult to understand the, the significance and depth of liberty without being appreciative of that civilizational background. And that, I think, is what really motivated him, because he talks about this all the time in books and articles that he wrote before, during and after the Second World War. So you wrote again in your article, Robki's lecture, however, the lecture you were talking about earlier, went beyond listing all the deep problems with the Nazi movement. He also sought to identify the essence of what the highly ideological movements of the right and left, then striving for power across Europe, wanted to annihilate. So this is backing what you're saying here. Here we come to the second dimension of Robki's lecture, his defense of liberalism. So how did he see liberalism? How did he define it? And how did it contrast to the Nazi vision? So I'm glad you asked that because liberalism, the word itself, means a lot of different things to different people. So in the United States, liberal basically means, in most people's minds, people who are in favor of extensive government intervention in the economy, as well as um, a, a range of views on any number of social and, and cultural questions. That's very different from how liberalism was understood in um, Europe at the time, as well as how Rupke himself understood liberalism. Liberalism, to his mind, was not about extensive government intervention in the economy. This is one of the reasons he was so critical of Keynes, because he thought that Keynes, by arguing for this type of intervention in the economy, had in a way corrupted liberalism because Keynes 
considered himself to be a liberal. Keynes was not a not a socialist. Keynes was not uh, what we would call a member, a, a Tory or a conservative. Keynes understood himself to be a liberal, oh. and Robke also understood himself to be a liberal, but liberalism meant something very, very different to him compared to the way that people like Keynes understood it, as well as a lot of American liberals or progressives, I think is perhaps a better way of describing them, did uh, from the early 20th century onwards. So liberalism was for Robke about a couple of things. One, it was about obviously liberty. Liberty in the sense of freedom from unjust constraint to pursue the goals that one sees as fit and as worthy of oneself. So that implies a certain sense that liberty doesn't operate outside a moral framework, that liberty uh, is directed in certain ways by who we are, what we as what we should aspire, what we ought to be doing with our freedom. This is an older conception of liberty, which I think is often lost sight of today. So that's one dimension. Another dimension of his thinking about what constituted liberalism was a commitment to reason, a commitment to using our reason, not just to understand uh, how to measure things, how to compute things, not just scientific or empirical reason, but he means reason as the philosophical search for truth. So that's another dimension. And by truth, he means more than just empirical truth. He means philosophical truth. He means the truth about who human beings are and their, their, their type of destiny. And he also thought liberalism also meant humanism. Now, by humanism, we should understand here, he's not talking about rejecting um, the religious traditions, for example, of the West, he sees those as part of this broad humanistic enterprise that, that draws upon the Greek world, the, the Jewish and the Christian world, and as we mentioned before, particular strands of enlightenment thinking, particularly what you might call the moderate enlightenment associated with people like Montesquieu, people like Adam Smith, people like David Hume, uh, people like Thomas Reed, uh, people like John Locke, etc. He sees all that as constituting humanism. So liberty, reason, humanism, these are the essence of what Robke be believed it meant to be a liberal, certainly in the context of the Europe that he was familiar with. So one of the things that I had read, which he said about... Um humanism in the context of economics was that one of his critiques of Keynes was that he saw humans as being cogs in the economic mm -hmm. machine, whereas that takes away from the fact that every human is an individual with a soul and they are what makes up the market order. They are what makes up yes. um, that whole thing and they're, and they're not just cogs in a machine. So, um, do you think that, you know, Keynes kind of won the battle now and we're in this place where people are thought of as cogs in the machine in the economic sense and, you know, more broadly in, in the ideological or philosophical sense? Like, has this contributed to the kind of decline of, of civilization that we see around us? So when Rob Key thinks about economics, as I mentioned, he was heavily influenced by the Austrian school of economics which takes the individual as the starting point of economic inquiry. And by the individual, we're thinking of someone who, um, who makes choices, who has freedom, who's not perfect, who can't know everything, uh, individuals who need to interact with other individuals if they're to flourish economically or otherwise. So in that sense, uh, economics as Rob Key understood it, was this type of humanistic enterprise. He called it old economics. And mm. by new economics, what he meant was the type of economic thought that Keynes, or more precisely his, apost his, um, his apostles and disciples, uh, propagated uh, after the Second World War, whereby economics becomes very heavily focused upon the macro dimension, whereby you think about big aggregates of things rather than bottom-up processes, where you have a sense that if 
you know certain things as a consequence of, of, of the Keynesian way of thinking about economics, then governments are in a position to basically pull levers and direct the economy in particular ways. And that's what I think he means by humans being reduced to being cogs in machine because it involves forgetting that these people are all quite different. They all have very different interests. They have different subjective appreciations of what they think is in their economic interest, etc. And Keynesianism, as Rob Key understood it, basically eliminated that from the way that people thought about economics. So I think, like, to a certain extent, like F.A. Hayek, he didn't really believe in uh, macroeconomics. He, for him, economics was about the micro dimension, starting with the individual and working its way from the bottom up. So what is the civilizational consequences of this? Well, it moves away the individual out of the picture and replaces the individual with these big aggregates. It also means that the government assumes a major role in the economy beyond things like ensuring national security, protecting private property rights and up upholding rule of law. And that particular thing I just mentioned, a rule of law is very important because for Rob Key, this was the essence, in many respects, the essence of what it meant to live in a Western humanistic civilization. And uh, once government gets distracted from that or is encouraged to neglect it or even violate it in, the, in order to promote these, these big goals like um, uh, a guaranteed employment for everyone, a big welfare state that will take care of everyone. He was very worried that the extent to which um, the new economics didn't seem to understand the long-term importance of rule of law in order to try and realize these big goals. That was his concern about how he thought that this, this new economics associated with Keynesianism would undermine some very important institutional bulwarks of Western civilization, particularly private property and rule of law. So you see here, this is the connection he's making between developments in economics and developments on the cultural and civilizational level. And that's something we don't hear a lot of economists talking about today. <laughs>